In this lesson, we'll be talking about another of the common question tasks, and in fact, two variations on a question task that you'll see on some of the critical reasoning questions of the GMAT. So let's just recap the logistics for critical reasonings in the verbal section. This is going to be the least frequently occurring question type, most likely in the verbal section. You're going to have approximately 10 of the 36 questions in the 36 question verbal section that will be critical reasonings. And usually about 80% deal with argument tasks and about 20% deal with inference tasks. And strategically, remember to assume about two minutes per question on average for these questions. You're going to want to spend a maximum of three minutes for any critical reasoning question. You're going to want to note the task of the question before you engage that paragraph prompt and limit yourself to a single prompt to reread before you move to eliminating and guessing uh, based on common wrong answers. And you'll always need to take targeted notes to proactively address your specific question task. And it is, of course, the primary question format to guess and skip if you are behind pace after question 12 or question 24. So evaluate an argument task come in two flavors, ultimately. You've got questions asking you to find new information to evaluate the validity of an argument that's been presented, or it's asking you to evaluate the method of argument, and it's kind of a cousin of the bold role style questions that you'll see within the critical reasoning as well. So strategically, you need to carefully consider the question phrasing to properly identify the evaluate task. You'll want to specifically identify the conclusion or potentially multiple conclusions if you have multiple speakers when it comes to these types of problems. And if you're seeking additional information to evaluate the argument, you need to identify the type of argument to broadly predict what relevant evidence might be. But if you're evaluating the method of argument, how it reaches its conclusion, you want to carefully track the facts and opinions of the argument as premises and conclusions. You also want to be aware of introducing variables that are not directly related to the conclusion. And of course, you can eliminate more quickly as choices closely match a prediction if you're being asked to find information to evaluate the conclusion presented. So our argumentation equation, as we know, always leads up to a conclusion, which is your subjective opinion requiring support. You have your premise, which are your objective facts providing that support, and your assumption, which is the implied unstated facts that must be true to link your premise to your conclusion. So when you are being asked to evaluate the validity of an argument, you need to locate additional information to help evaluate whether implicit assumptions linking the premises to the conclusion, conclusion are likely or not likely to be true. So basically, the answer to a question or information pertaining to that subject can help determine whether the argument's conclusion seems real, uh, realistic. And arguments, of course, can be categorized in multiple ways, but focusing closely on the specifics of the premises can help to provide uh, to predict the type of evidence needed to evaluate that conclusion. So our common arguments, we know in an analogy, we're just saying that A is equal to B. And to evaluate an analogy, you need to answer the question, are the items comparable in relevant ways? For representation, the question you need to answer is basically, does the sample represent the larger whole? For data and evidence interpretation, you need to answer whether the data can or cannot be interpreted another way. For causalities, you want to determine, are there other possible causes or outcomes out there? Or is the circumstance merely coincidental? And for plan or recommendation-based arguments, you want to find information to help answer if the execution of the plan is necessary, and will that plan or recommendation reasonably work to accomplish whatever the goal of the plan is? So let's take a look at an example here. So as always, we're going to read the question stem first and recognize key terms indicating and evaluate the argument task. So we've got which of the following would it be most useful to establish in order to evaluate the argument above? Of course, we see the word uh, evaluate in here, but useful also just indicates we need something to help understand what's happening. So then we'll read the paragraph prompt. Many people believe that humans have an almost psychic intuition that allows them to know when they are being watched. This belief has been corroborated by a recent study in which 100 individuals were each seated alone in a room with a one-way window pane and asked whether they were being watched from behind the window pane. The subjects correctly determined whether they were being watched 80% of the time. So we've read the prompt and we can note that we've been presented information from a study. So we basically want to see if the evidence seems reasonable to lead to the conclusion that, you know, humans have a psychic 
intuition that lets them know that they're being watched. So of course we note the explicit conclusion, which is right before, and make sure that you're not just saying this belief has been corroborated by a recent study in your notes. You of course need to make sure you articulate for yourself what that belief is. So then we want to broadly predict what the correct answer should do to help evaluate this argument based on its reasoning. And we need to find information to help determine whether the evidence from the study is representative or can reasonably be interpreted in another way. So we introduce our answer choices as always, and we're going to eliminate for common wrong reasons. So vague impacts, how the subjects were chosen. Oh, that, it couldn't be more vague, like just how they're like, there's so many different possibilities there. And so we can eliminate choice E pretty directly. And then we have the other common wrong argument reason for evaluate tasks in particular, which is a task reversal. And ultimately, it's going to introduce additional issues to evaluate. So it basically introduces more questions that, than answers. So how many of the subjects believe in psychics? We're not talking about psychics. Like, that's a whole new concept. So we can eliminate choice A pretty directly. For choice C, what time of day the experiment was conducted? Uh, again, I've got more questions than answers. Like, nighttime, daytime, morning, afternoon, before supper? I have no idea. So that's not going to help me to evaluate the conclusion. And whether the subjects were paid to participate, well, you know, that might explain why they participated in the first place, but it doesn't necessarily explain how they were able to tell that they were being watched. Now, choice B may seem irrelevant at the outset, but whether the window pane was soundproof, well, if the window pane isn't soundproof, they might be hearing the person behind the window pane. And of course, if the window pane was soundproof, then they weren't able to hear that person. If it wasn't soundproof, they were able to hear that person. And in fact, they weren't necessarily being able to tell that they were being watched. It was that they heard the commotion behind the window pane. And that's how evaluate and argument task correct answers work. They are going to have an outcome that is different depending on the answer to the question or information that is presented. And that's why the correct answer for this one would be B. So now we go back to our argumentation equation and consider the other type of out evaluate an argument task where you're being asked to evaluate the method of an argument. And so for these types of questions, you need to carefully diagram your premises and conclusions on your scratch pad. So you're going to literally start articulating what the pieces are and how they fit into this equation. And you're only going to predict broadly by noting facts and opinions as they're presented in the argument as well as how they lead to the main conclusion of the argument. So you're not going to predict like exactly what the answer is going to say, but you're going to find an answer that matches your notes about what parts of the argument are premise, what parts are conclusion, and how those facts and opinions interact with each other. So let's take a look at an example involving the method of an argument and needing to evaluate that. So we can see a sample prompt here on the left-hand side of the screen, and we read the question and stem first, and we see the politician responds to the philosopher by, and there's a blank. So the key term here is response, because that's asking how does the politician present the argument ultimately. And so that's going to indicate that we need to evaluate that argument. And in this case, two arguments, because we've got two speakers. So we read the prompt to diagram the argument as presented on our scratch paper. So we read philosopher, the best leaders shape public opinion while challenging society's basest emotions and instincts. Well, that's just a conclusion. So I might just write down on my scratch pad something of the, uh, of the like of PH for philosopher, period, C for conclusion, and state best leaders shape opinion and challenge society. And that's just a statement of opinion by the philosopher without any evidence whatsoever, which is kind of strange argumentatively, but it's what's being presented. So there is no premise. We just note the conclusion of the philosopher. So then we move on to the politician. While that may have been true in ancient times, the realities of modern democracy make it impossible to get elected on such a platform. Effective modern officials, modern elected officials, officials must instead mold their principles into moderated policies that the public is willing to adopt. Okay. So we have to break down what the premise and the conclusion is for the politician. We do that with like a little PO in a period indicating politician and P is for premise. And that's the first sentence. And we can just paraphrase best leader shaped opinion in ancient times, but now cannot. So we're paraphrasing, but those are facts as presented by the politician, which lead to the politician's conclusion illustrated by the PO dot C, C for conclusion, 
effective modern officials must mold principles to public opinion. So this is basically a recommended course of action. It's the politician's conclusion as a plan. So then we introduce our answer choices, seeking the process of eliminate for common wrong argumentation reasons, because there's no further prediction that we can make. We just diagram the prompt and we need to find an answer that matches the information that we've taken down. So vague impacts can still be eliminated and choice B illustrating that modern society is more evolved than ancient society was. I don't even know what more evolved would mean based on the terms that are presented by the philosopher and the politician, so we can eliminate choice B. And then we get into a task reversal, which is basically stating for an evaluate the method of argument task that the method is incorrectly articulated by the choice. So for choice A, for instance, it says the politician responds by demanding evidence in support of her claim. And you as reader may think this philosopher needs evidence, but the politician doesn't actually demand it of the philosopher. So that allows us to eliminate A because it's not what the politician does, even if it seems like a reasonable response. Then we go to choice D and we see using an analogy to prove the point mute, moot. Well, the politician doesn't have an analogy of some other scenario that's similar, so we can eliminate choice D. And then choice E, lamenting that ancient times were better than those of the modern politician. Again, that just sounds like something that maybe a modern politician might do, but that's not what this politician is doing. Now, Choice C, accepting certain tenets of her argument, but qualifying it for contemporary circumstances. Well, the politician does accept that what the philosopher said may have been true in ancient times, but then says that it isn't really true anymore in modern or contemporary circumstances. So choice C is going to be our correct answer here. And you can see that if you focus on what the task is asking and make sure that you don't incorrectly interpret said task, these questions are not necessarily as difficult as they may seem. You just have to make sure that you consider both the structure of the philosopher in this case and the politician. If there are multiple speakers, you have to diagram each of those speakers. So let's talk about how we work through and evaluate an argument task. First, as always, note and identify and evaluate task by recognizing key indicator terms and determine the specific of a type of evaluation that is required. Then you'll have to read the prompt as written to determine the common type of argument or note the premise or premises and conclusion or conclusions if there are multiple speakers in an, an argument diagram kind of following our standard argumentation equation structure. And if it's an evaluate additional information to determine the validity of the claim, then you want to predict a bit. So if you have a common argument that's identified, you can more specifically predict what relevant useful evidence might be. But if you can't identify a common argument and it's an evaluate the validity of the conclusion, evaluate an argument task, you can just use the generic prediction of find info to help determine if it's reasonable to conclude that whatever the conclusion is. And of course, step four, eliminate your choices against the additional information prediction or the argument diagram using your common wrong answer reasons. So let's head on over to the whiteboard and take a look at how you will engage your scratch pad to address this specific category of critical reasoning argumentation style question on the GMAT. So here we have a sample critical reasoning style question. We're just going to write out A, B, C, D, E for process of elimination. And we can see that we're being asked for how the passage above proceeds. So we just need to find a way to evaluate the method of argument. So when we're being asked to evaluate the method, we know that we're gonna need to talk about the premise and we're gonna need to talk about the conclusion. So starting at the beginning, we've got governments often respond to public criticism of necessary social services by introducing additional regulations overseeing those services, and those regulations can lead to higher costs for consumers. So the premise is basically to set a standard of response for government and outcome is basically an increase in dollar cost. Then we have the public in the state of prime, a prime is actively 
criticizing government-funded early child care services. But in this case, families should not necessarily expect to incur greater costs as a result. So we know that we've also got basically, if I give myself a little bit more room here, we've got more premise of just what's happening in Prime. So we know that Prime public is mad at, we'll just call it, uh, GF, government-funded CC, child care. But the conclusion is that the cost is not expected to go up. And that goes directly contrary to what we have from the evidence. So this is an interesting structure in that they set a precedent and then basically say precedent isn't going to hold in the state of prime. So choice A, presenting a broadly accepted circumstance that its conclusion questions as a rule. Weirdly phrased, absolutely. But there is a broadly accepted circumstance that, you know, government increases the regulations, regulations increase costs, but then we've got questions as a rule. Well, questions on an individual basis. So the second half is wrong. So this is basically a reversal of the task because we know that it doesn't question it as a rule. It just says there's an exception here. Now, considering alternative approaches to a common problem, that's definitely not what's happening. We know that there's clearly some alternative circumstance that's occurring, but there's no alternative approaches. I might even be able to say common problem. I don't know that this is necessarily a common problem. Theorize about or theorizing about the cause of an outcome before questioning that explanation. Again, they don't really question anything in the general structure of this. They just say that it won't hold in this prime example. Positing a set of facts and presenting an exception to them. There we go. That's exactly what we were looking for. We know that we've got some facts that are stated at the beginning, but then there's this exception that's going to happen in prime. We don't know why, but it's being presented. And then arguing that a generally held principle needs an overall reevaluation. Well, no, again, we're not saying that it's wrong or anything. It's just saying that in the state of prime, this isn't expected to happen for reasons that haven't exactly been articulated. So our correct answer here would be choice D. So let's scroll on down and we'll take a look at one more example here. Frame that up a little bit. So setting up the scratch work, as always, we got A, B, C, D, E. And this time we're being asked which of the following would be most useful to investigate for the purpose of determining if trust in judges will allow the public to have faith in the punishments for given crimes. So I actually already know what the conclusion is. It's basically all of this stuff after the if. But we've got this determine, we've got useful, these are indicating evaluate tasks. So I need to read the paragraph and we just know that our predicted way to evaluate is somehow going to address whether the public will have faith in judges and punishing crimes. So starting from the beginning, Determining an appropriate punishment for various crimes requires evaluating the intent of an individual who commits an illegal act, okay? However, evidence of intent is much more difficult to obtain than is evidence of an act itself. Therefore, trust in judges is necessary for the public to have faith that reasonable punishments will be meted out in the courtroom. It's relatively abstract as an argument goes for the GMAT, but we can just use our broad prediction here and say find info to help determine if trust in J's for judges is needed for public faith in reasonable Court punishments. So, relatively straightforward prediction, not going too deep into the specifics of the type of evidence because it's not all that clear, maybe, in this one. So, whether judges are generally capable of evaluating the character of defendants. Well, we're trying to evaluate the intent of the defendants. And if we shift the term to character 
that's going to require additional information. So we don't know how character relates to intent necessarily. So we can eliminate that for the fact that it needs uh, an additional information here. So then we got choice B, whether the public believes that judges are capable arbiters of criminal intent. Well, we're definitely concerned with judges and criminal intent. If I don't know what arbiters means, I have to put a question mark. If I do know what arbiters means, this might seem like the right answer already. Now, choice C, whether individual judges may levy different punishments in similar cases. Okay, may levy, that is incredibly vague. I don't know if it happens how frequently, so that we can call vague and eliminate. Choice D, whether evidence of intent can be discovered in the course of an investigation. Well, we already know that. It just says it's more difficult to obtain. We don't need to know that it's, like, you know, impossible. This actually, if anything, is kind of a reversal of the facts. And whether juries are involved in determining punishment guidelines. Well, that, too, is going to introduce the new variable of juries and will require additional information. So our correct answer is B, because arbiter means judge, basically. And the judges are the ones that the public believes in, so they need to be able to determine whether intent existed or not from evidence or not, potentially, according to the, to the prompt. So this is the two ways that you'll need to potentially evaluate arguments on the exam. Try some practice problems on your own to get better at these specific types of critical reasoning tasks.